Three young women with big lives ahead of them disappear under mysterious circumstances. Their families have theories, but police don't have much to go on, and media coverage is hard to come by. These are the stories of Clea Shindra Hall, Phoenix Colden, and Christine Kupka. Hello, listeners. Thank you for jumping back in and listening to The Abyss Pod today. My name is Hallie. And I'm Brittany. As you guys know, we're your beloved hosts, and we are super excited to dive into this case collection with you guys today. These have been recommended to us from listeners, and we were really excited to dig into them. So we hope that you are excited to dig into them as well. If you like what you hear and you're listening on YouTube, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and the bell notification. That way you can get all of our latest videos up and we can nag you about it. And if you are on social media, follow us on Instagram and Facebook, Twitter at The Abyss Pod, and you will see updates on cases, funny little true crime memes, any updates on episodes, if that's where you get your notifications from. Also, if you want to help support the show, we have a Patreon now where you can go and donate a few dollars every month. Right now, we don't have any extra tiers that are merchandise or video content or anything like that, but we do plan on adding that soon. So if you want to get a head start on it, you can go ahead and join. Let's jump into it. The first case that we're going to cover is Cleoshindra Denise Hall. She was born March 30th, 1976, and she went by Clea to those that knew her. She was incredibly bright, super intelligent. Her mom said she was a little bit of a nerd. She was a senior honor student at Watson Chapel High School in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, and she participated in the school choir and the school band. She loved kids. She was always babysitting, always being around kids. She worked in the nursery at her church, and her mom said she was always having kids run around her house that Cleo was babysitting. And because she loved kids so much, she really wanted to become a pediatrician, and she was going to go to Tennessee State University for their pre-med program after she graduated that May of 1994. She was even chosen to give the commencement speech at the graduation ceremony, and she had a summer internship already lined up in Boston, so she was really well on her way. She knew where she wanted to go, and she was working really hard for it. She had an after-school job that she would work at most days at the home office of Dr. Larry Amos, and when I say doctor, I mean PhD, not MD. That'll kind of come into play later. (laughs) She was doing some clerical work and helping him with paperwork and filing and all that good stuff. Amos was the executive director of the Arkansas Federal Child Care Nutrition and Educational Service. Quite a mouthful. And Clea didn't have a car, but she would usually just call her parents from work when she was done and they would come grab her. She was a really reliable, upstanding kid. She had no history of running away or doing any rebellious things or anything like that, no nefarious activities, which made what happened next all the more mysterious. The first week of May in 1994 was a blast for Clea. She was 18, so she was in her prime. She had her senior prom, was going to a sorority ball, and she also celebrated Mother's Day. On May 9th, Clea's mom, Laurel, picked her up from school, and she took her by Amos' home to get some work done. No one was home at the time, so they ended up going back to their home, and Clea just took a nap, kind of relaxed for a little bit, and waited till she heard something else further from the Amos family. Amos's wife called around 4.45 p.m., and she said, hey, I'm home. If you want to come by, we can get some work done. And so Clea's mom got her, they got in the car, and headed that way. When Cleo was dropped off, she didn't have any keys because her mom drove her, and she didn't have her ID on her either at the time. Cleo called her mom around 8 p.m. and told her that she wasn't really ready to go home yet, she still had to get some more stuff done, and she would let her know soon. Her mother ended up falling asleep accidentally and woke up around 1 a.m. when her husband was coming home, and she realized, you know, Clea never called. She never got a ride from me, and she clearly never got a ride from anybody else because she's not home at the moment. She called the Amoses and was told that she clocked out at 8.30, so that's only 30 minutes after her phone call to her mom. 
I feel like if she was that close to being done with work, that's something where she would have been able to pinpoint that and been like, hey, if you could just pick me up in 30 instead, you know, but I just think that's a little bit fishy. Yeah, for it to be so close. He said that Clea left without telling him and all he heard was the garage door go up and some car noises. Remember that her mom dropped her off. So if he heard car noises, she clearly didn't walk out of the house. That means that someone must have picked her up in some sort of way. Laurel was really nervous. She stayed up all night waiting for Clea, thinking maybe she was just having a rebellious streak and that she would come home soon. It was just out of character. The next morning when Clea wasn't home, her parents called her friend Scott Walker. Her and Scott and Clea were really just friends. He was 23 years old and in the Army Reserves. He hadn't heard from her though and he wasn't the one to give her a ride, so he had no idea what had been going on. When Clea didn't show up for school, this was even more of an alarm for the family. Her parents tried to report her missing, but the police said they had to wait 24 hours, which was just ludicrous that that was even a thing back then. CNN quoted Laurel saying, quote, It's been very frustrating for us. We feel that police didn't do everything they could have done at the beginning when she first went missing. We had to wait 24 hours in those days before police would take a missing person's report, end quote. Amos being the last person confirmed to have seen Clea should have kind of cast a suspicion on him, but police, I guess, didn't see it that way. He was allowed to leave town the day after Clea was reported missing. He said he was going to buy some tanning beds for a new business, and he just kind of bounced for like a week. (laughs) Which, he's like a doctor. I don't know why he's buying tanning beds and starting a tanning salon. Isn't that considered bad for you? I don't know. (laughs) PhD, not MD. (laughs) That's where that comes in. (laughs) Amos didn't actually give any kind of official statement until days later when he returned from this trip. And here's when his official story started changing. If you remember first, he told the family that Clea had left around 830 and that he only knew that because of the garage door noise and the car noise. And later he said that he actually did see her waiting for a ride and then getting into a car. Clea had reportedly told a coworker that she was planning on just walking the half mile home, although normally she did get a ride. And this was only minutes before she left, so not a lot of time to change plans and all of that. If you remember, this is like the 90s. There's no cell phones and like texting your mom or Uber or anything. It's literally like they call the landline at the office or you don't hear from her. Two weeks after the disappearance is when police finally conducted a search of the Amos home slash office. Reportedly, there was no sign of foul play here, but it had been two weeks and he had been on a trip. So that's so much time to clean things up, throw things out, you know, do all that stuff. Reportedly, they only looked around quickly and then he made them leave. So even then, they didn't really see all that much. So I wouldn't say that that's like a conclusive search. Clea's mom said, quote, I don't understand why police could not search the home immediately to make sure there was no sign of a struggle there. Maybe they would have found her press on nails or her hair extensions there. Who knows? End quote. Even worse, it was known that Amos had been making Clea kind of uncomfortable with some comments. He'd even commented on her friend Scott Walker dropping her off sometimes and making comments about being a lady and, you know, just kind of misogynist, things like that. Amos never even contacted the Hall family or offered any sort of support or help or empathy or anything. He never helped with the searches, but he did later publicly say to a newspaper that the police should really get state and federal help with the case. So that's kind of a strange thing to me. (laughs) Amos was also later involved in all kinds of shady dealings. There's lots of (laughs) things that we could go into there, but we're just going to kind of breeze past that and you can kind of investigate it yourself if you want to know but there was like fake charities and real estate deals and all kinds of stuff like that basically he wasn't an honest guy yeah in the bare minimum sense (laughs) yeah seriously a lot of people even saw amos ripping down missing person posters around town and paying other people to rip them down which is just always the most wild thing to me i just don't understand why we hear about that so much police scheduled amos for a polygraph test but he refused when the time actually came and police didn't really find any other evidence in the home or in their investigation but they still kind of considered larry amos a person of interest 
They didn't really have any other leads to go on either. There was no boyfriend in the picture. Amos couldn't describe the vehicle that Clea supposedly got into. And again, this is before cell phones, so no tracking and all that stuff. Their only other person of interest was Scott Walker. She may have kind of had a crush on him or at least been good friends. They hung out quite a bit and he was interrogated. His car was searched. No leads were found there. He did take a polygraph test, but the results were inconclusive, but they kind of considered him cleared. Some people think Clea simply ran away, but almost no one who actually knows her thinks that. She had so much going for her. She was so bright and happy. She loved the work she was doing and all of her goals. So a lot of people really think that she was abducted and taken against her will. In 2009, the reward for information was about $10,000. And in March of 2012, the show Find Our Missing, which was a show that focused on black missing people, went to investigate this case in the area and they stirred up some new interest and some new talk on this case. So that was really good. On March 29th, 2012, the police executed a search warrant from a tip that they had received of Amos's home. Amos had been renovating his home since shortly after Clea's disappearance, and it went on for the next couple of decades. Witnesses who were doing a renovation on the home shortly after the disappearance had a few things that they needed to say about it. One person stated that they saw blood on insulation in a false wall. This was actually written in an affidavit, which just makes it more solidified. Like this person was going to the extent of putting it in an affidavit to say that this is what they saw. One of them had been hired to fill a hole in the ground. It was super deep and it had fresh dirt at the bottom and he was told to throw some bricks in the hole and then fill it with concrete, which is really suspicious. Like why not just fill it with dirt or top it with grass like that? Like why concrete? Also, one of the people who had been pouring concrete into the hole in the backyard smelled something really horrible. They said it was an awful smell that they had like never smelled before. When doing their search, they brought canine officers, cadaver dogs, radar equipment, and multiple investigators. Four items ended up being taken from the home, and apparently the police didn't send the evidence to the crime lab immediately, which is obviously mishandling the <laughs> evidence. It took the evidence 40 days to arrive to the crime lab. The family was furious because they obviously think that this causes the evidence to maybe have been messed with or obscured in some sort of way. And Brittany made a good comment where it's just like odd that everything pertaining to Amos kind of takes forever to get done. It's like they're purposely dragging their feet or they just don't even care about the case. Maybe it's just kind of strange. Yeah, that is really weird how they handle everything that has to do with him. And it makes me think maybe he has some pull in there somewhere or in the community or maybe they're just lazy. I don't know. (laughs) Which makes sense if he's like running these schemes. You know, there's dirty cops. There's people who infiltrate the cops by like paying them off. There's also him being like a doctor and being super wealthy. He could get away with more, pay, pay people off like that. So different ways it could go. Chief Brenda Davis Jones said that they were checking on evidence every week and they were just really keeping on top of it. But the lab said that at the time of this statement during the conference, no evidence had even been submitted. Kathy Rule, a tech who works in the crime lab, forgot to send it. So it turns out that at that time, the chief had actually lied in their statement. Roll ended up being suspended for five days after this, but it's just interesting that the chief had no backlash from this whatsoever. When the lab tested the items, they found no blood evidence, which isn't really surprising because at this point in time, you have a doctor who possibly committed a crime. You don't think they know how to clean up blood. You don't think they know how to sanitize and sterilize things, not to mention that it's been 40 days past that they're even getting this evidence, you know, so it, it kind of, it doesn't create a lot of confidence in Amos's case. Laurel even has some clashing going on with chief davis jones because she said that the chief just was really disrespectful and insensitive towards her in the case and that clea's disappearance wasn't really taken seriously clea would be 44 today and we'll have her age progression photo on our website so be sure to check that out every year on the anniversary of her disappearance and on her birthday and a couple other significant days the family comes together to 
commemorate her, to talk about her. They all wear pink to show their support and they release balloons in her honor. Her mother has advocated for legislation to help abducted children in the future and has never stopped looking for answers of what happened to Clea. She appears on shows and is still very vocal about the case. As of December of 2020, Laurel said that police don't have a suspect, but they do have a couple persons of interest. Her family's created a scholarship for other students that want to become pediatricians like Clea did. Clea is African-American. She's about 5'8". She has brown eyes and black hair. She has a surgical scar on her right knee and a slightly chipped front tooth. She was last seen wearing a white shirt and shorts with navy polka dots on one side and stripes on the other. If you have any information on Clea or her case or her work, or her whereabouts, you can call the Pine Bluff Police Department or the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and we'll have those numbers on our website and in the show notes for you. Diving into our next case we're going to cover is Phoenix Lucille Colden. She was born on May 23rd in 1988 in California to her mother, Goldia Reeves. Her birth name matched her mother's. Her name was Phoenix Reeves, but she was adopted by Lawrence Colden, which was her mother's new boyfriend then husband. They ended up moving to Spanish Lake, Missouri together, and Phoenix was an awesome daughter. She was homeschooled from the age of sixth grade on, and she played piano and violin and guitar, not to mention she was crafty on the handbell at church. She was described as friendly and intelligent and deeply religious, and she was also a junior fencing champion, so she was literally in all aspects of what she could get her hands on. She was always growing, always learning, always partaking in different activities, and She only stopped fencing when she was in college, but recently she had showed a new interest in fencing and wanting to pick it back up. At the age of 18, she moved out from her parents' home and moved in with one of her friends. Her mom co-signed the lease, was very supportive about it all, and she was just living her life very happy. She started to attend the University of Missouri in St. Louis, and bringing up towards the time of her disappearance, she was a junior at that college. In May of 2011, she ended up moving back in with her parents. On December 18th, 2011, Goldia and Phoenix went to church, as they usually did. After church, Lawrence saw Phoenix get into her 1998 Chevy Blazer. It wasn't that weird for her to kind of sit in her car a lot because she would make phone calls in her car for privacy. But around 2.30 p.m., Lawrence saw her pull out of the driveway He figured she was just going to the corner store. Maybe she was just going to see a friend or something like that. She was 23 at this point, so it's not like she was asking permission every time she went out or anything. Just before 5.30 p.m., Phoenix's blazer was found about 25 minutes from her house. It was abandoned, and this is where a lot of confusion about this case stems from. Many accounts of like the initial reports and the news reports and articles and things like that say that the car was found with the doors open keys in the ignition and running which kind of paints a scene but the cop that actually found the car said it was not on there were no keys there were no open doors it just seemed like a routine abandoned car no red flags so with this I feel like the cop may have had a reason to lie just because It may have been kind of mishandling that situation that didn't connect the car to Phoenix's disappearance right away or something like that. Yeah, we've definitely seen it in other cases where the police officers maybe messed with the crime scene, not realizing that it was a crime scene. And then they have to go back and they've put back in the evidence and was like, whoa, no, oh my gosh, this is how I found it, you know? So it's not foreign that that could happen. Yeah, and it was so often like told that the car was found that way that it's kind of hard to tell you know which way it really went um but maybe the cop was telling the truth and the accounts were just kind of sensationalized at the time either way like both accounts of what was seen paint an incredibly different result of her disappearance yeah for sure 
And we haven't seen the official police report or anything. So it's kind of he said, she said. The family is really not sure where the rumor about the car running and the door open and all that came from. So we don't really know what the source of that was. But her glasses, purse, and ID were inside the car. The car was impounded at 623 with no real search of it being done. The plates weren't really put into the system quickly. It was kind of just written off as an abandoned vehicle and they just sort of towed it to the lot. Police said that her car was found in one of the highest crime rate areas in the entire country, and they think that maybe it was dumped there instead of someone just walking away or a snatch and grab like that. Phoenix's family had no idea that her car had been found until a family friend just happened to see it in the lot during a search for her, and that was on January 1st, so that was almost two weeks after the disappearance. Goldia said, quote, I just wish those police had done what they were supposed to do by running those plates and seeing that the vehicle was registered to me. All they had to do was say, do you know where your vehicle is and look where it was found? Why didn't they check around the area to make sure somebody was not injured or passed out nearby? Why did we have to learn from someone else where our vehicle was? According to the officer, he didn't do an inventory sheet because there was nothing in the car, but that's not true. When we checked the vehicle at the impound, there were lots of things in it, including her glasses, her purse with her driver's license, and her shoes, end quote. Her mom does not think that she took the car there voluntarily or on purpose. When the car was finally searched and DNA was taken, it was only found that the DNA belonged to Phoenix or her parents, and there was no activity on her bank accounts, her social media, or on her cell phone or anything like that after she disappeared. Police really didn't show a whole lot of interest in investigating this case. They pretty much immediately wrote her off as just a runaway and really not worth investigating. So it didn't gain a lot of traction. Because of this, the parents decided that they were just going to take the investigation into their own hands. They went and talked to drug dealers, sex workers, and other people in that sort of underbelly of St. Louis. They used all of their savings and their home was actually foreclosed on due to the financial stress of this investigation. It's important to think about the mother and father literally putting themselves in a dangerous situation in one of the most dangerous cities just to find their daughter. After she went missing, her family learned that she had some secrets. She actually wasn't enrolled in college for the following semester like they had thought. She had lied about it to her parents and her family and even some of her closest friends just to keep up this charade. She had lived with her boyfriend, Michael. Sometimes he's reported as Michael B because there's going to be another person we address in a minute who has the same name. (laughs) But she was living with him before moving back in with her parents, which she had hid from them as well. This was possibly due to religion and them not being very supportive of her living with her boyfriend at the time. Her friends reported that she was having some strange behaviors. She started listening to different music. She was trying drugs. She got really paranoid and irritable and even sad and depressed. She started to argue with her parents a lot more than usual and she even started carrying a knife and telling her friends that someone was watching her and coming for her. She supposedly told her friend Akira that she was planning on packing up and leaving town, but but her and Akira had a fallout shortly before her disappearance. Phoenix had two cell phones as well. One of them was on her family's plan, and one of them was a secret one that she paid for on her own. The account for this phone had gone into collections before her disappearance because she wasn't making payments on it. On this phone, she communicated with another man named Mike, who she was seeing on the side from Michael B., Her friend said that she wanted to leave Michael, but she just couldn't do it. Mike wasn't really thought of as a good guy, though. His ex said that he was pretty violent, and she had also filed a restraining order against him. When the ex asked if he had something to do with Phoenix going missing, he allegedly told her, quote, why are you worrying about someone who's dead, end quote, which is pretty weird to say. A lot of times whenever you look at true crime, usually they don't say things in the past tense or like she's gone you know and they don't say that she's dead there's always hope that she's alive so for him to be a boyfriend and say it I mean for us if we were to think that she was probably dead it's not as abnormal because we don't have an emotional connection to all of these people that we're talking about but under these circumstances it's kind of weird that he would just be like why are you worrying about someone who's dead like who said she's dead 
Yeah, that's a very definitive statement on his part. And even in this case, I'm not even sure she's dead, you know? Like, we don't, like, sometimes you look at them and you think they probably are dead or something bad probably happened. But in this case, you can't even really tell. So it's strange that he would just jump to that. Phoenix made a video about a month before her disappearance and said that she had been ditched and that she wanted to start over, but she just felt like she really couldn't, that she was trapped. She went on to talk about some of her regrets for the choices she has made in life, and she couldn't remember the last time that she was really, truly happy. She ended up praying in the video as well, and and it stated that this could have been a sign of her declining mental state or that she somehow was in over her head with something such as like her circumstance or a relationship or who knows. She, she might have been overwhelmed and didn't know how to get out of it. She could have also been in a moment of distress and was venting and this could be significant to her disappearance. It could not be significant. It could not be significant, but we don't really know at this moment. A private investigator also was put onto the case and they found two birth certificates for Phoenix, one of them saying Phoenix Reeves, one of them saying Phoenix Colden. Another investigator tried to take this lead and run with it. They like went really hard into this and Brittany and I don't really think it's a big deal that she has two just because she was adopted, but they really took it and like ran with it. They came out empty handed, but they still tried. They found out that there were Four other Phoenix Reeves in the country listed, and three of the four were quickly ruled out, but the fourth one was considered a mystery. There was no social security number, no relatives, no birth date listed, and there was an address to Anchorage, Alaska. So these private investigators literally went up to Anchorage, Alaska, and no one had seen or heard from Phoenix, and that's kind of where that ends with the birth certificates. So they went pretty hard to go to Alaska to look for her, you know, but it didn't really come of anything. Yeah, I really don't know why they fixated on that so hard because I really don't think that that's all that strange. (laughs) Yeah. Police theorized that she pretty much just ran away. She appeared to be somewhat unstable leading up to her disappearance with the behavior changes and the video being found saying that she wanted to run away seemed to maybe bolster that. She also had made the comments about leaving town And some even speculate that her parents were very controlling and critical of her and she may have just wanted to escape. Friends said that there were times when she wasn't even allowed to leave the house. So maybe she ran away to escape that, but it's pretty hard to run away and disappear completely, especially without like a lot of money and help and stuff like that. So it could happen, I guess, but I don't think it's super likely. There was an oxygen documentary about this case and in that one friend said that there had been occasions that Phoenix had sort of left and cut contact with her parents for weeks or a couple months but her parents emphatically deny this as being true. They say that that's like a complete lie, never happened, like no doubt about it. The investigators in the documentary said that Phoenix may have been taking savings bonds from the family safe and cashing them, but this hasn't really been corroborated. Her mom said that Phoenix was having problems. She was struggling, but she was really trying to come back into her family, into her faith, and sort of just pull herself out of those struggles. Another pretty prominent theory in this case is that she was sold into sex trafficking. Her parents say that Her kind of sheltered upbringing may have made her a little less street smart, so she may have been susceptible. St. Louis and Kansas City are major sex trafficking hubs, and her car was found near I-70, which connects the two cities. I-70 has even been referred to as, quote, the sex trafficking highway of America, end quote. And apparently St. Louis is in the top 20 in the country for sex trafficking, which is pretty crazy. The odd location of her car may indicate an abduction of some kind. Her changes in behavior and uncertainty about her f- and uncertainty about her future may have made her more vulnerable. We know traffickers prey on young people that kind of feel like they don't fit in or don't know where they're going, and they really latch onto those people and sort of manipulate them, provide them what seems like good options for escape, but really they're just using them. 
Also, as a side note about the parents, I've seen a lot of people say that after they watch the documentary that they think that especially Phoenix's mother was being unhelpful and even combative with investigators and they kind of condemn her for this and say that she was hampering progress in the case but I feel like if you've seen that documentary they don't really paint Phoenix in the best light and I'm sure her family thought that the documentary would be more helpful and you know help them with financing investigation and going down these avenues and bringing the case back to the public's attention. But in the end, it kind of just sought to tear the family apart a little bit. So I feel like the parents being a little bit upset by that in the end is not really that strange to me. I think Goldia really wanted help in finding her daughter and exposure for the case and the documentary came across a little bit sensationalist and accusatory even so I think them being unhappy with that is justified to some extent. The last kind of theory that is given on this case is that Mike was responsible but there's really not much to go on here. He made the comment about her being dead. He has a violent history And her parents think that maybe he was a gateway sort of to the quote unquote wrong crowd or that he could have gotten her in trouble with someone else. So that could be, but there's just almost nothing there to investigate further. Phoenix's parents think that she is still alive, but being held against her will. They say that there were things left behind in her car, like an ID, half eaten snacks and sodas that made it just not realistic for her to just get up and be gone forever and walk away or even have the intention to disappear. There was even a note found in her car, supposedly according to the family, and it had been torn up. It may have been written in Phoenix's handwriting, but it was super hurried and rushed according to her mom. We're not sure what it says, but it seemed to be significant to the family. Police suggested that it was a note Phoenix and her mother had been passing back and forth during church, but Goldia said Phoenix did not sit with her at church, so that doesn't seem like it would be what the note is, as long as Goldia is telling the truth. Goldia said Phoenix likely wrote it in the parking lot after church while she sat in her car waiting for her mom to come out, but she also could have written it in the driveway before they even left for church. The retired deputy police chief, Joe Dahlia, has tried to help the family with the investigation whenever he can. He's trying to provide them with resources and information, just anything he can to help the Colton family. In 2012, an unnamed man in Texas gave a tip that contained details that seemed pretty realistic and like he could only know it if he knew the case. He said he even knew where Phoenix was. The family spent the last bit of their money on a PI And they wanted their PI to follow up and see if this could give them any leads, give them an answer to where their daughter might be. But unfortunately, the man ended up admitting that he had made the whole thing up for attention. The police ended up doing nothing about the fraud. And this caused the family to go into foreclosure. And they had to plead their mortgage company and it didn't even matter. They didn't care. So it really put the family in a bad place. The Colden family had been a victim to a lot of other pranks and hoaxes, and a woman even claimed to be Phoenix, so they have had a really tough go trying to find their daughter, and people just aren't taking it seriously. The family tries to appear on TV to keep her story alive and maybe even reach Colden or her captors. Goldia appeals to Phoenix a lot in case she can hear her. She said, quote, If you get a chance, get away, run and go for it. Don't be afraid. You'll be safe. End quote. She also told Phoenix that the past doesn't matter. They can work through any trouble that Phoenix is in and they just want her home. Her case was featured on the Vanish podcast in 2016 and had that two night special on the Oxygen channel in November of 2018. And that documentary is where a lot of this, like the video that she took and the birth certificates um that's where like that kind of information was uncovered 
In 2018, a friend of Phoenix was on a flight back to St. Louis from Las Vegas and said that she believes she saw Phoenix boarding the plane. She looked at the woman and said Phoenix's name. And the woman looked at her and said, oh, do I look like someone? And the woman just kind of walked past her and didn't engage anymore. But the friend was pretty sure this was Phoenix. She said that phoenix was with a group of women and there were two men with them she even said that when she got off the flight she tried to tell authorities that there was a missing woman on the flight but they couldn't find her by the time that they i guess got all the information together other friends of the family have stories about seeing her but nothing concrete has come out of it if you have any tips at all you can contact the tip line or the st louis county police department and we'll have those numbers in the show notes and on our website and you can contact them that way. Also, be sure you visit the Black and Missing Foundation website, blackandmissinginc.com, for more information about missing people of color and the issues that surround their representation and the coverage of their cases. Going on to our last case of the episode, we will be talking about the disappearance of Christine Kupka. Christine was born on May 3rd in 1970. She was the youngest of six kids, so she was always able to run around and play with other kids, be adventurous, try new things. Her father was a firefighter, and her parents ended up getting divorced when she was really young. After her dad passed away, they all moved to Madison, Wisconsin. Kupka was known as really strong-willed and intelligent and even had a style that was somewhat bohemian. Kupka attended the University of Wisconsin and then she ended up dropping out and moved to Atlanta and then she moved to New York where she started at Baruch College. She had a GPA of 3.97 so she was super smart and studious and doing really well. She founded the school's philosophy club and she planned to become a civil rights attorney through law school. She even had a huge voice in women's issues, so she was very determined, very political, and put herself on the forefront of issues to be a change in the world. Kupka was a really hard worker. She was supporting herself through a waitressing job at a Caribbean restaurant and lived on a minimal budget with five roommates. She had $7,000 in a savings account that she had just been growing over time. And her and her friends even used to have competitions about who can save the most money. So it would be like, ooh, guess what? I got to school today with barely any gas. I didn't fill up. And then the other one would be like, well, I just walked today, you know? And like, they would have competitions on who could save the most. Eventually, Kupka started dating a guy and I might butcher his name. They call him Rudy, though, but his full name is Darshanand Persaud. He was an Indo-Guyanese American immigrant, and his father was a Hindu priest. He was an instructor at the Baruch College in New York City, and he was described as super pleasant and nice, very cordial, knowledgeable, and he was a really good teacher. While Kupka was attending school to get her degree in philosophy, Rudy ended up being her adjunct chemistry teacher. He was also in dental school at the time and was working as a chemist. They ended up exchanging numbers while she was in his class, and he told her that he was single, he was about to go on a business trip to Turkey at the end of the semester, and around the time of his business trip, they started dating. Around mid-June, Kupka told Rudy that she was pregnant. Initially, Rudy tried to tell her that there's no way he could have been the father because he had a partial vasectomy, which doesn't even make sense because if you get a partial, I mean, like, I don't know. That just doesn't make sense to me. I feel like you partially still work then. You know what I mean? So he was saying that the baby couldn't be his, but this was a lie. He never had a partial vasectomy and he confessed that later. Kupka told her friends that Rudy was just not being supportive. He wanted her to get an abortion, but she really wanted to keep the child and he didn't agree with her at all. Even though Kupka never stated that she was concerned about her safety. People close to her say that she acted pretty fearful around Rudy about him possibly hurting her or hurting the baby. She even would, she would also only meet up with him in public places. Supposedly, Rudy was a little bit scared because his family would disown him if he knew that Kupka had a, had a baby and she was carrying it to term. 
His family was very religious. It would just put a shame on his family and they would stop paying his tuition. Ugh, the audacity. This really didn't bother Kupka though. She was like, whatever. Like, I'm going to have the baby. I'm okay with being a single mom. You don't need to be a part of it. She was like, I'm graduating in January. I have a good house. I'm 28. I can do what I want and I can do this. So it turned out that Rudy was actually not single at all. He was actually married to a woman named Rochelle and he didn't tell Christine this until after he discovered that she was pregnant. In fact, he was engaged when they started their affair and then got married right after they had sex to conceive the child. They had only had sex once, so she knew exactly when it happened. And that business trip to Turkey was actually his honeymoon. Christine kept trying to reach Rudy. She called him over and over again, but he just didn't want anything to do with her after that. She did end up reaching his wife, though, and they kind of talked it out. Christine said that she didn't want to ruin the family, ruin his marriage or anything like that. She just wanted Rudy's name on the birth certificate so the child would know someday who their father was. And if she ever needed financial help, she would have that already done. Rudy's wife kind of commiserated with Christine about being screwed over by the same guy. And then eventually they just stopped communicating. In October of 1998, Rudy showed up on Christine's porch and told her that his wife kicked him out of the house and that he was staying at a cousin's house. Kupka really encouraged him to stay with his wife and make up, make it up to her. But Rudy started hanging around Christine a lot, and he even seemed to be more supportive of the pregnancy. This was kind of confusing because of his prayer actions and like how passionate he was about not having this baby. But he started offering up Hindu baby names. He was a little bit more physically affectionate with her. But she told him that he could be in her life for the child's sake, but there was not going to be another romantic relationship. On October 24th, 1998, Rudy showed up at Kupka and her roommate's apartment a little after 11 a.m. He had called the day before and said that he was super excited that he had a new apartment in Queens and needed help cleaning it up and he wanted to show it to Christine and everything. She wasn't quite ready, so her roommates buzzed him into the apartment and they reported that he was super on edge and nervous. He was just pacing around, he had his hands in his pockets and he seemed pretty distressed. Christine left with him around 12.30 And before leaving, she called her sister and left a voicemail saying that she was going to see Rudy's new apartment in Queens and she would talk to her later. But Christine was never heard from again. When she left, she didn't have a coat or many personal items. She didn't have much money on her and she just didn't show up. She missed her midterms and she was only a couple of months away from graduation. She had all these huge goals and big plans. So it's not like she was in a position she would just want to, you know, take a little vacation or anything. She was also five months pregnant at the time, which complicates it further, but she was just never seen or heard from. When Kupka never returned to the apartment that night, her roommate got pretty worried and contacted the Kupka family. Since Kupka was over 16 years old and under 65 and was of sound body and mind, a missing person report just couldn't be filed yet. Her friends, Kevin and Nick and sister Kathy, were determined to get some more information. They showed up to Rudy's house to confront him about where their friend was, and they ended up meeting his uncle and mother. His uncle hadn't seen Rudy from Saturday morning to Sunday evening, and the friends just like were so heated. They started throwing facts at his mom, being like, this is the this is what we know. This is where we've been. Rudy was with her. Like, what's going on? And... Rudy's mom just asked them to come back at seven because that's when Rudy would be there. Rudy and his family called the police to also be there at seven to prevent any altercations because he said that two men were harassing his family. And supposedly the conversation went as Kevin asking, where's Christine? Rudy answered, how should I know? Nick said, you killed Christine. Where is she? And Rudy said, I don't know what you're talking about. And why don't you go file a missing persons report? Which... If Rudy was back in the life and that's his child inside of her and he really was coming around to wanting to be a part of it, he would be wanting to file a missing persons report. Yeah, just 
by virtue of being a de- decent person, someone you were close to, someone that... Who's carrying your baby. Yeah, you'd think that he would be a little bit concerned <laughs> at bare minimum. Rudy told them that he took her shopping at this shopping center and then he just waited in the car for her. He then dropped her off two blocks from her home between 3 and 4 p.m. so she could walk to a health food store on her way back. He wasn't able to tell the family and police which stopping, stopping, which shopping mall he had taken her to, which seems a little fishy to me. I know you're in New York, but there can't be that many shopping malls and there's no way he sat in the car waiting for her and drove her there. Didn't know where he was driving and then sat in the car. Didn't look up where they were. Didn't look up at a sign. Nothing. You know, that just kind of rubs me wrong. I feel like with a lot of New Yorkers, especially people that have lived there a long time, they can just tell you where everything is all the time, you know? Yeah. Like they do everything based on street cross. What's it called? Like crosswalks? Cross intersections like (laughs) cross cross they do everything based on intersections and you know street names and things like that so the fact that he just had no idea where he was in this significant moment is like "Mm." the friends then went on to question people in the neighborhood to see if they knew anything the laundromat owner said that he might have seen her walk by but it turned out that he had mixed up his days One of the health food stores in an area said that they may have seen her pass about 7 p.m., but it turns out that the woman they saw had peach pants and Kupka didn't have peach pants, so they ended up recanting their statement. It would be a full week before police would start to do a missing persons investigation. They were really scrutinized for how slowly they got onto this case, considering it was a pregnant woman. On November 2nd, the authorities questioned Rudy once after the disappearance, but he got a lawyer and refused to answer more questions. A direct quote from the Charlie Project said, quote, Authorities have said he was cooperative during his single interview, but have also mentioned that he did not have an alibi for the time Kupka vanished, and they felt that he was evasive at times during the questioning, end quote. As for the searching... They checked the D train, which she took to school, and they checked all of the stops that it went to, so that way they could see if maybe she got off, anyone had seen anything. They did an aerial search over Brooklyn and Queens and took pictures. Christine's family and friends conducted searches in the area to see if they could find her, and they got specialists in to look at maps of abandoned industrial sites, parks, and wetlands, and they were utilized several times a week, so that way they could check and see if she maybe had been left there a body dumped or anything since those are kind of those are more likely places that a body might be left the family ended up hiring a private investigator and tried to continually publicize her case the pi made a public statement saying that he believes that rudy was involved in her disappearance christine's sister also put up a billboard for information on the case Investigators said there's not much to go on, but suicide is a possible option, which her family vehemently disagrees with. They said that only motive can link Rudy to the investigation. Lieutenant Philip Mahoney said, quote, I can tell you this. None of the four detectives on the case think it's open shut. This Rudy may be the guy. You certainly had a guy with a motive. He was the last one seen with her. You can't ignore that. But it still doesn't add up. It's no crime to be the last person seen with somebody. It's no crime for a married guy to get his girlfriend pregnant. It's a shame, but not a crime. You can even say, I have plenty of reason to want her gone, but you're still not going to get an arrest on it. Our biggest fear is she's lying in a ditch somewhere, the result of an accident or random mayhem, and we're walking by her every day because we're focused on Rudy. End quote. Which I don't think that's a kind of a fair assessment of it. Like you can definitely be looking at multiple avenues in the case at once. And just because you can't find information on him doesn't mean that it's not there. In 2009, Christine's mother passed away, never knowing what happened to her. In 2010, a shop that had been owned by one of Rudy's family members was searched after it finally had new owners that allowed the search. There was a concrete place in the basement that seemed different from the others, and they brought in cadaver dogs and ground-penetrating radar and even thought that maybe the dogs had hit on something, but when they dug it up, nothing was found, and it pretty much remained a cold case. WebMD says, quote, We found that homicide was the leading cause of death among women who were pregnant. 
and accounted for 20% of deaths among that group compared to 6% of deaths among non-pregnant women of reproductive age, end quote. And that's from a study from 1993 to 1998, which is an older stat, but it was pretty relevant to the time that Christine disappeared. Christine would be 50 years old today. She had red hair and blue eyes. She has a scar on her nose as well as freckles and her ears are pierced. She went missing from Brooklyn, New York. She's about 5'8 and 140 pounds and was last seen wearing a lightweight black sweater and a long black skirt with black boots. And we'll have all of the numbers and places you can submit tips on our website if you have any information on her case. It's horrifying to read all these cases about missing women, so make sure that you take precautions to ensure you and your loved ones are safe. 